Welcome, everyone. It's a real pleasure being here today talking to you uh, about a passion of mine. Uh, I'd like to present the next generation of genome sequencing. So what we've seen in the last uh, 15 years is the, uh, is the first uh, sequence, sequential sequencing of the human genome in the year 2000. It was a monumental moment in uh, biological history. And what we, what we learned from it has actually started to transform our lives, and it's informing us right now. But there are some steps that still need to be taken to bring us to the full potential of that. So before I go into more of the human genome sequencing, uh, what exactly is genome sequencing? Uh, so one genome is simply the genetic, some genetic material of a living entity. And for us, that's DNA. And DNA, as we can see in this classic helical structure, is just a linear stretch of four nucleotides, A, T, G, and Cs. And these are arranged in a very unique combination, which program the creation of all the proteins and structures that our body needs to function into life. So, so a genome is nothing more than information. And sequencing a genome is all about accessing that information for retrieval. So this was most famously done in the 1990s during the Human Genome Project. Um, what we learned from that over, over the course of 13 years, at a cost of $3 billion, was that every human is constituted of 3 billion base pairs, which is about 25,000 genes. So this was, this was a monumental uh, achievement for science, and it brought full circle the original discovery by Watson and Crick 50 years prior of the double, hand, double, double helix. But 10 years later, present day, we are notably absent of medical breakthroughs that were promised, that we were expecting to uh, solve some of, some of our major diseases, breakthroughs that could help treat cancer or heart disease, or autoimmunity. Um, why hasn't it done, why have we not seen these returns uh, on our investment? Well, it comes down to the, te the technology at the time. The, to sequence the first human genome took 13 years using a warehouse full of sub-sequencers, first, first generation Sanger sequencers, running at 24 hours every day. So, there was, a lot, there was a large bottleneck, and these machines were very, very complicated to use and operate. They had uh, laborious sample, sample preparation procedures, very fragile gels, expensive reagents, laser scanners. Um, it, was a very, it was a very complex procedure. And to think about where we, the problem in another way, and where we stand, stood at the beginning of the 21st century, this is, this is basically where scientists were. We're. We had big, expensive, and clumsy machinery. So the Sanger sequencers that decoded the, full, the first human genome was very reliable, uh, and it was robust. However, it, its complexity was raised a huge barrier to the sequencing of additional genomes. And this was a problem to scientists for many reasons. Primarily, in order to transform the full potential of that one seminal moment when a genome was completed, you actually need to compare it to several others. Information of one is not very strong information. So with a huge bottleneck and the lack of computer, computing processing power at the beginning of the 21st century, um, a lot of researchers were not able to fulfill what they needed. So we, we were at a standstill for a while. 
But the excitement that was released by the Genome Project, it created a, a lot of demand, a demand for capacity. And this demand among scientists drove the research into a different direction, to produce new and cheaper and faster next generation technologies. To do this, people thought about, well, this is just, DNA is simply an information storage material. The molecular, by, by, a, historical, uh, by a happy historical accident, the molecular biology revolution happened to coincide with another revolution, the revolution in uh, computers and computing power. So if, if DNA is nothing more than information, could the two somehow be merged to drive down the cost of this technology and also speed up its output? Well, um, it did. It worked extremely well, actually. Uh, so this is the innovation curve from the oops. this is the innovation curve of these hybrid sequencers that were trying to meld both sequencing technology and uh, uh, computer, computing processing power. So what we see on the top line is Moore's law, which was, as many people know, Gordon Moore's. Gordon Moore's prediction that the level of processing power doubles every 18 months. When we, when we plot the cost per genome on a logarithmic scale and the cost per billion sequences over the last 10 years, we see that there is a general trend going with Moore's law. But four years ago, something happened, and that's when some of the next generation sequencing sequencers were released onto the market. These were the, these were the machines that had at their core not the original Sanger sequences, but a combination, a marriage of two, uh, two technologies. And that's when we start to see, at this inflection point, the, the cost rapidly dec declining. And it was at this point that these machines started, started to be called next generation. And once you get to a certain price point, so for example, in 2008, it started off at $1,000 per megabyte. Within five years, that dropped to mere pennies. And at that price, information is just a commodity. And we have information so cheap, it'll take, off, it'll take on a life of its own. So, which, what, what were some of the, com the companies that used, used a next generation approach? Um, one of them is called Ion Torrent in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And they've actually started partnering with a California based company called Light Technologies. And they offered, four years ago, when prices started to rapidly decline, they offered a personal genome machine, which took the sequencing reaction into process out of the large and specialized research centers and into the small personal lab of the investigator. And just two months ago, this company actually released this product, the uh, Ion Proton, it's a nice name. And what this little, little device can do is accept uh, a, a, ge a genetic sample and do all of the sequencing upon it as one of the original Sanger sequencers. Um, furthermore, the way it works is actually just pure genius. At its, at its core is uh, a semiconducting chip. A semiconducting chip that's no different than anything that Intel fabricates and has been fabricating for the last 40 years. But what this company is using this chip for is to translate the biochemical signals of sequencing directly into an electronic signal. And since chips are extremely good at processing and moving electrons, we essentially have the fusion of molecular biology and biochemistry with computer circuitry, and, uh, which is amazing in itself. But when you leverage the 40 to 50 years of semiconducting, nanolithography, fabrication uh, efficiencies in the computer industry, you can actually see enormous economies of scale. So every two years, 
this chip actually doubles in processing power. So for example, as the integration increases, in the last four years, this chip has become 1,000 times more powerful. But uh, there's another company that has something to say. Not to be left out is uh, Nano, uh, Oxford Nanopore, based in uh, the UK. And they have a somewhat similar technology, but what they've done is actually pretty amazing. This is, a, this is one of their sequencers, which has been shrunk to the size of a USB stick. And its portability is its key advantage. It operates on a similar principle as the ion proton in that you have artificial, artificial pores embedded within an artificial membrane. And it's within these pores that a, a grown genetic strand is extruded. And that strand is uh, recognized and sequenced as unique electronic signatures for each nucleotide. Um, so they're similar in that way, but they, this type of device has benefits and advantages in portability that uh, most other sequencers do not have. So for example, this would be perfect for someone who wants to do field research, someone who's going out to the wild, going up into a rainforest or sampling an ocean water environment. All you have to do is throw a few of these in your bag, collect some samples, and plug them into your laptop you will have your data within hours, maybe a day, without the use of a specialized lab. So these are the two, these are two very interesting companies. But I mean, what's, what's the bottom line? How, how good are they? Um, how next generation are they? So the first generation sequencers, as, as we've seen, it took, a, it took 13 years to sequence one entire genome. It cost $3 billion. <coughs> Within 10 years to the present, that time has reduced from 13 years to just two hours. From $3 billion to $1,000. This, this is a level of improvement and exponential scaling that has never, ever been seen before. It makes, it makes Moore's Law look like a horizontal line. So when you, have, when you have something becoming so cheap, so commoditized, when it's so easy to sequence your whole genome, imagine the fact that that's going to have on uh, medical care. If you can get your geno genomic information for the price of an MRI or an X-ray, it's probably going to spread. It's probably going to start at a few hospitals and research centers. But within predictions are five to 10 years, it's going to go all across the country. So at this level, we can actually start to translate the original promise of the human genome sequencing project, which was by getting the density and samples necessary to, con to conduct some of the cross-analysis that's needed to make the discoveries, uh, the, new, the, new, the latest uh, medical breakthroughs. So for example, if you have enough samples, if you have hundreds and thousands and, min and millions of people whose whole genomes have been sequenced, you can start to do the comparative analysis. For example, compare 100 people who are, have a predisposition, predisposition to cancer and 100 people who do, not, who do not. You can do a comparison to see where the regions of similarity and differences lie and map out disease susceptibility, but only when you have this level of sequencing done. So in the future, there's going to be a new information superhighway. Let's, if you think about the previous map, there's about, there's about three gigabytes of information within one genome. If you start sequencing thousands and millions of people, it's, the information processing is going to be mind-boggling. Mind so how, how, how big is that? Uh, just to, at, at certain levels, some, some numbers are just too big, and you can't really like, get your, wrap your head around it. So we can think about it in e a little bit easier ways. So an MP3, that, a high quality MP3 that's, not, that's bought the right way, might be about 10 megabytes. A DVD is 5 gigabytes. 
an order of magnitude higher than that. A laptop being sold right now is 500 gigabytes, and an external hard drive is one terabyte. So a terabyte is, until recently, that was uh, a number, a level of scale that we would never even have to worry about or think about. So how much, how much data and sequencing uh, in storage needs does a typical research center have? One, one research center produces 320 terabytes per week. So this is a, a famous quote by Tony Cox at the Sanger Institute. And he's the head of genomics sequencing at, uh, at his institution. When you have this level of information and this much data, it, it blows out of the water the IT capabilities of any institution, whether it's a, a lab or a hospital or even a government agency. That's just too much data for anyone to handle. So what's going to happen with it? How do you handle it? Where do you store it? Where do you move it? How do you even think about it? So, well, there is, there, there's another trend that's mirroring um, the computer processing uh, revolution, and that's, and that's the data deluge and the birth of big data. As our societies become more and more wired, as much of our life has moved onto the internet, and marketing is go goes there, entertainment, music, into, into, uh, mo movies. A lot of the information is being stored and outsourced out of, our, out of our own physical premises. And this is probably going to be the path for this type of technology. When you have billions and, and terabytes of information, you're going to have a, a need to store it somewhere. And cloud services are actually going to be probably the, the, the solution in the, in the near future. So one, there's actually one, one company, Complete Genomics, nearby in Mountain View. And they're actually leading the way using Amazon of all sources. Uh, Amazon's uh, cloud services to store a lot of their patient data and their, their sequencing data. And it's a model that works for them. And it's probably going to be a model that leads the way for the industry. So there's, so in the, in the history of molecular biology, in the history of science in general, there's been, a, there's been a few discoveries, there's been a few developments that have interrupted the gradual and general pace of progress. You know, vaccines were one, penicillin was another, the human genome was a milestone, but it won't, it won't, won't by itself become a revolution. This type of technology and the scaling and the processing that we've just seen will actually kick off a new revolution to understand the human condition, to understand what makes one person susceptible to disease, what makes one person <coughs> resistant to disease, what makes us age. When we have this much access to our genetic knowledge, society's going to change and change for better. Thank you.